Amongst all the changes occurring in and affecting cyberspace, there is a third historical force. And this is not well understood in Europe and North America. The demographics of cyberspace are changing. The who of the Internet is shifting quickly from the global north and west where the Internet was invented to the global south and east. It is in the global south where the biggest explosion of Internet connectivity is happening. And this shift is significant because it is starting to affect the state of cyberspace. Some of the fastest growth rates are occurring in the world's weakest states failed, fragile states, sometimes autocratic regimes, uh, countries that maybe only within the last two decades ago were authoritarian countries, if you think about South Korea, Taiwan, etc., um, or countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, that have very fragile democracies. They're going through these huge explosions in connectivity, sometimes on the order of a thousand percent per year. Uh, right now, Africa has more internet users than North America. If you think about that for a second and the significance of what that means, it's pretty remarkable because most of the growth is happening in a context of failed fragile states, uh, maybe conservative cultures. Um, the technologies are empowering people, which is creating governance challenges for regimes that are already corrupt and maybe autocratic. Uh, which is leading to uh, a much different uh, social and political context for the internet. And I think that will begin to affect the internet itself. It already has, for that matter. So how is this dynamic affecting the internet? For instance, we are already seeing increasing nationalization of internet resources, so that the experience of cyberspace is increasingly localized. What this means is that the internet users are experiencing in China is very different from the internet users are experiencing in India, and that's very different from the internet users are experiencing in Egypt or in Nigeria. We're seeing politics trumping technology in a way that the original designers of the internet didn't anticipate. So at the core of the internet is this idea you have this apolitical uh, neutral network that that, that uh, routes information regardless of where the nodes are, uh, that's being subverted gradually by national territorial controls and political limits on connectivity. Internet outages, uh, where governments actually unplug the internet, used to be very rare. Now we see them almost on a weekly basis. So that, that gives you a sense of the arbitrary nature of how politics can affect internet connectivity. We're going to see more of that type of internet censorship, surveillance happening as the vast majority of users come from the global south. And the countries of the global south are entering into cyberspace at a different time and in a vastly different context than the early adopters. They are entering cyberspace after US whistleblower Edward Snowden had revealed the global network of cyber espionage operated by the NSA and its partners. At a time when cybersecurity has already risen to the top of the international agenda. And most importantly, at a time when products for cell phone tracking, computer network attacks and social media infiltration are being offered commercially on the global market. All of these developments do not bode well for the future of cyberspace. And we can already point to several important developments that give us a sense of where cyberspace is heading. For instance, we are seeing a growing number of strategic partnerships between regimes that prefer a state-controlled internet. A good example here is the close collaboration between China and Iran on how to control the internet and the free flow of information. Uh, China, of course, has been a pioneer in erecting state controls around internet access and downloading surveillance uh, responsibilities to the private sector to operate in China in order to get a license. Iran has been wanting to develop similar techniques. So Iranian and Chinese uh, policymakers have been meeting, 
sharing best practices and strategies and even technologies. A lot of Chinese equipment and software is being used now in Iran to build Iran's version of their own uh, national intranet, uh, so-called safe internet, uh, that will prevent Iranians from accessing content outside of Iran proper that the authorities don't want them to respect. But also we're seeing more targeted digital attacks coming out of Iran against Iranian opposition groups abroad, very similar to what we have seen in the case of China and Chinese cyber espionage against human rights organizations. China is also a major investor in surveillance infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa where most countries are going through the dual process of having massive internet growth rates whilst experiencing severe governance challenges. China offers a solution to that problem through its technology and its highly developed strategies of information control. These are not isolated incidences that we could dismiss as mere anomalies. Rather, there have been numerous cases of human rights activists in countries like Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain being targeted by advanced spyware manufactured and sold on the open market. This was uncovered by researchers at the Citizen Lab who, shortly after the Arab Spring, were given samples of suspicious emails that had been sent to human rights defenders. By reverse engineering these emails, Citizen Lab researchers discovered spying software that had been sold to the government in question by companies under the name of Hacking Team and Finn Fisher. We took those digital signatures and scanned the entire internet, literally every internet connected device using high speed computers to map the command and control infrastructure of Hacking Team and Finn Fisher. And through that, we were able to identify the country clients of Hacking Team and Finn Fisher and found that their product, this very advanced commercial spyware, was being sold to some of the world's most uh, notorious authoritarian regimes. These are examples of just two companies that are part of a growing global market. A market dominated by Western companies offering products that are being used to limit democratic participation and to identify and target opposition groups. These developments force us to rethink our assumptions about the benefit of the Internet for social mobilization and democratic change. We have this tendency, especially in the West, to celebrate events like the Arab Spring as paradigms of what these technologies can do to bring about the end to authoritarian rule. We call them liberation technologies. But once we look more deeply into what is actually happening in cyberspace, we can see how the very means of online organization and emancipation can become real sources of insecurity employed as secret weapons of war and repression.